If it's Wednesday, the U.S. halts a package of weapons to Israel and warns that additional assistance could be at risk as Israel ramps up military action in southern Gaza despite pleas from the White House and humanitarian groups. Plus, Donald Trump's classified documents case gets postponed indefinitely while a Georgia appeals court reopens the possibility of disqualifying D.A. Fonnie Willis from that election interference case. All as the former president faces the fallout of Stormy Daniels' graphic hush money testimony. And the second gentleman of the United States sits down with NBC News for an exclusive interview on how he and the rest of the Biden administration are contending with two major issues, abortion rights and the rise in anti-Semitism. Welcome to Meet the Press Now. I'm Gabe Gutierrez in Washington, where the Biden administration's diplomatic efforts to influence Israel's strategy and its war against Hamas may be nearing an inflection point. Last night, a senior administration official told NBC News that the White House halted a shipment of weaponry to Israel, specifically over concerns that it would be used by the Israeli military in Rafah. The official also raised the possibility that future aid to Israel could be halted, too. Today, top administration officials at the Pentagon and the State Department echoed those warnings. As we have uh, assessed the situation, uh, we paused one shipment of high, high uh, uh, payload uh, munitions. Um, and, uh, and again, I, I think we've also been very clear about uh, the steps that we'd like to see uh, uh, Israel take to, to account for and take care of those civilians before uh, major combat uh, takes place. We have paused one shipment of near-term assistance and we are reviewing others. We do remain committed to Israel's security. We re remain committed to Israel's defense. Um, but in the context of the unfolding situation in Rafah, it is a place where we have very serious concerns and that's why we take the actions we take. That move by the administration comes as the State Department is also working on a report about whether Israel has violated international law during this war, which could result in suspending future transfers of military assistance. An Israeli official tells NBC News there is deep frustration in the Israeli government over the Biden administration's decision to withhold these weapons, only adding to the ongoing tensions between President Biden and Prime Minister Netanyahu. It comes as the Biden administration is also ramping up pressure on Israel to agree to the latest ceasefire proposal. CIA Director Bill Burns continuing his shuttle diplomacy, meeting with Prime Minister Netanyahu today to discuss the latest round of talks in Cairo. This morning, White House Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre spoke to reporters aboard Air Force One, striking a cautiously optimistic tone that a deal could be close. The talks are continue. The talks are ongoing, and I think that's important to note as well. And I said this yesterday, and I'll say it again. A close assessment of the two uh, sides' positions suggests they should be able to close the gap, the existing, the remaining gap. So we're going to continue to support that process, and that's where we are right now. It is a top priority for this president. Despite those diplomatic efforts, Israel continues to launch what it's describing as limited precision operations in southern Gaza, as aid groups warn that those military activities further limit their ability to reach the civilians sheltering in Rafah. And joining me now is NBC News international correspondent Hala Garani in Cairo, and Monica Alba is at the White House. Hala, Hala I want to start with you. What's the latest on those ceasefire talks, and is it salvageable despite some of the rhetoric coming from Israel? So Bill Burns, the CIA director, we understand, has returned to Cairo after meeting with uh, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu of Israel today. We understand, according to sources, that the differences between the two sides, Hamas and Israel, and these talks mediated by Qatari officials, Egyptian officials, and of course by the United States via Bill Burns and other diplomats, that these talks are ongoing, and that in itself is a positive signal because they have not collapsed yet. And as you mentioned in your introduction there, there are so many pressure points now on Benjamin Netanyahu. There's, of course, that suspension of offensive weapons shipments that took place last week. Uh, there is also this shuttle diplomacy by Bill Burns, but also internally, uh, Gabe, inside of Israel, hostage families and public opinion is more and more pushing uh, its government 
for some sort of deal to get the hostages out, at least and in the first phase, we understand 33 hostages uh, and would be released. And, and, and that is one of the contentious, I was going to say, that was one of the disagreements, we understand, that Hamas was promising 33 dead or alive, right. and Israel was insisting on all live hostages in and the first Hala, phase. And I want to pick up on something you said, the White House's decision to halt the weapons shipment. How is Israel reacting to that? So as you mentioned, they're deeply frustrated. That's what a source has told NBC News. I don't think they believe this is some radical reevaluation of the U.S.-Israeli relationship. In fact, it's called a pause. It's not a suspension. It's not permanent. It's of a specific uh, uh, grade of weaponry. Uh, we're talking about the very, very damaging 2,000-pound and 500-pound bombs. Those are, the one, those are the ones that create gigantic craters that take down even if uh, a military target is, is uh, uh, is ultimately uh, uh, the, the aim that the, of the Israeli military, uh, the, the target would take down uh, residential buildings and other structures and therefore harm civilians. Um, Hala, I want to mention um, that report, that highly anticipated report uh, from the State Department on whether Israel violated international law. Are the Israelis concerned about the results of that report? Uh, well, as you've mentioned, it's been delayed, and the results of the report are going to be very keenly uh, studied, I'm sure, uh, in Israel. Concern, I'm sure, on any level there will be concern if there's a document that assesses or concludes in any way that Israel's use of weaponry or that its offensive operations in Gaza have not abided by international law. But, for instance, we've seen how they've dismissed the International Criminal Court, for instance, findings, and other international bodies critical of Israeli actions. So will it be something that will have an impact on its, the country's operations in Gaza? That, that would be rather surprising at this stage. Gabe? Hala Garani, live for us in Cairo. Hala, thank you so much. I want to turn now to the White House and Monica Alba. Monica, uh, back to the weapons shipment. What else do we know about why the White House is pausing that shipment, and is this just a one-off? Well, we are learning that there is some linkage here, Gabe, to what the U.S. was assessing in Rafah specifically, that because they were seeing these limited strikes and Israel's pledge to continue to move in militarily, that this is a moment where they're going to reassess what kind of weapons could be going to Israel, specifically, of course, those multi-thousand pound bombs in this moment because of what they are doing and what they say they will do. But at the same time, the U.S. government is saying that this isn't a final decision and this isn't something that is going to be determinative of what will happen in the future. So there's a little bit of a pause, which is connected also to this larger conversation you were just having about that report that will assess and determine again the future of potential military aid to Israel. So those things are happening on parallel tracks, but of course they're related in terms of what the U.S. will ultimately do when it comes to providing and selling those weapons to Israel. Gabe. And Monica, if the White House is already halting weapons shipments because of concerns over Rafah, can we infer anything about the report you mentioned about Israel's conduct in the war? And remember that this report has been weeks and months in the making, and even if there was a sort of recommendation that comes out of this report that says that Israel did violate international law in some way, there would still be then a period of determining what would happen after that that would take place over 45 days or so. And so right now, administration officials effectively tell us that there is a delay that could be days, it could be up to a week, but there are several factors it seems like that could be at play that could be contributing to all of this because of the ongoing fragile talks and these hostage negotiations and because of again what is happening in Rafa right now all of these things seem to be connected and these are the conversations that are happening behind the scenes but the administration is saying that they do intend to complete that report it's just a little bit unclear when and of course mm. yes they miss their own self-imposed deadline Gabe and Monica we've heard for weeks that the White House opposes a major Israeli ground defensive in Rafah but have White House officials indicated whether there will be any consequences if Israel launches you know larger military operations because right now Monica it appears that Prime Minister Netanyahu just isn't listening 
I remember that there had been all these virtual meetings that were taking place between Israeli and U.S. officials about what the plan would be for Israel to relocate the more than one and a half million people who are currently sheltering in Rafah. We know that process, it seems to have started, but the U.S. has still not seen complete plans that would convince them that this is something that is possible in order to really protect civilian lives and avoid civilian casualties. But we think back to another incident uh, earlier in this war when Israel, in an airstrike, killed those World Central Kitchen aid workers. And it was at that moment that the U.S. said, we are willing to reevaluate our policy in Gaza if Israel does not do enough to change the way it's protecting those workers and to do enough to get more humanitarian aid into Gaza. This could be a similar moment where if the U.S. determines that Israel is not listening or doing what it thinks is appropriate with respect to Rafa, there could be continued questions about then that U.S. policy. But as we know, Gabe, that hasn't shifted yet. This is the first time we're seeing those weapons being halted for now. But that is the question that all of this is raising for the future. Monica Alba, live for us at the White House. Monica, thank you. And joining me now is Democratic Senator from Oregon, Jeff Merkley. Senator, thanks, thank you so much for joining us. You were one of just three Democrats to vote against the foreign aid supplemental because it funded offensive weapons for Israel. So the White House has halted a weapons shipment to Israel over concerns they would be used in Rafah. Do you view this as a shift in policy by the administration, and does it go far enough? It is the first time that such a hold has been placed on, on bombs. In this case, it's 2,000-pound uh, bombs and 500-pound bombs and various sorts of bombs that were used in Gaza in, in what the president has called an indiscriminate matter. Uh, and that manner of bombing has resulted in uh, well over 30,000 deaths, uh, some 24,000 women and children. So I do see this as a positive development for us to say it's not okay for U.S. weapons to be transferred to Israel and for Israel to use those in this sort of indiscriminate fashion with such a, an enormous toll. But Senator, will this actually make much difference if Israel still wants to go into Rafah? Does the administration need to be doing more? And what should the president be doing at this point? Well, one thing you should be doing is using the National Security Memorandum 20. The report was due today, but it's been delayed. And it is essentially uh, a new NSM-20 uh, that has been put in place in the last defense authorization. And basically, it gives the president leverage to say to Netanyahu government uh, that, look, uh, if you restrict aid to go into Gaza, and we know that there are now famine conditions in Gaza, as well as lack of medical care, water, power, communications, transportation, all the factors that provide a basic foundation for existence, he should use that leverage to say this is unacceptable. We have to get much more massive of level of aid in. And he should use it as leverage to say that it's unacceptable uh, for American weapons to be used in an indiscriminate uh, manner with these enormous uh, casualties. And, and Senator, as you know, the State Department will miss its uh, deadline uh, for that report into whether Israel is, is violating international law. What are you hearing about what's behind the delay? Well, what I'm hearing is that there's a big argument going on in the State Department. Uh, there are those who are saying we have to accurately report the facts and follow the law. And those are there are those who are saying there's political uh, considerations yep. here. And we do not want to uh, uh, basically do what, such a uh, high integrity review of our ally. What, Senator, you said, you know, some people think and politics might factor into this. What do you believe is the cause for the, for the delay? Well, I do think that this is being worked out as to whether the State Department is going to, to essentially say, hey, we will follow the process but you, even when it's an ally. But and Senator, I, I hope that that view wins out. But do you believe politics is playing a role in this delay? I do think consideration of uh, using this power, a country that we work very closely with, is a very significant step for the administration. They're wrestling with it, uh, certainly probably wrestling with it more intensely in a campaign year, but also because we do have a, a close and productive relationship with Israel on, on many issues. And, and um, in this case, however, the way they conducted this campaign is out of sync with American values and restricting aid and producing a famine is out of sync with American values. And so I, I do hope 
Uh, the president's team says we've, we've got to follow the facts where they, they lead. And where they lead is we cannot provide aid to a country that is restricting aid and producing a famine. Senator, your House Democratic colleague, Rashida Tlaib, went so far as to say that our country is actively participating in genocide. Do you agree with that? It's not a phrasing that I would use. I would say because of our close relationship with Israel that we are closely tied to the consequences in Gaza. I've worked on a lot of human rights issues when we're criticizing uh, China and, and saying, look, this uh, slavery with the Uyghurs is unacceptable, the treatment of Tibetan children taking away boarding schools is unacceptable, uh, the firebombing of 350 cities in Burma is unacceptable. In this case, we're in a situation where our close ally, our partner, is engaged mm -hmm. in a strategy that is producing enormous carnage, and it's very tough, different situation. We're used to criticizing kind of our folks who are not our, our, our allies. And so I, I feel uh, strongly mm -hmm. that we have a greater responsibility to act here than any other humanitarian situation because of that close relationship. And Senator, I want to play some of what your colleague Senator Sanders said about President Biden's handling of the war and the protests. Let's listen. I am thinking back, and other people are making this reference, uh, that this uh, may be uh, Biden's Vietnam. I worry very much that uh, President Biden is putting himself in a position where he has alienated not just young people, but a lot of the Democratic base uh, in terms of his views on uh, Israel and this war. Senator, the president has taken incoming from both sides on foreign policy. So do you think some of the decisions he's made are going to hurt his reelection bid? Well, I have been holding town halls out in Oregon. I've held 16, and people can come and raise any topic they want. And the most, the largest issue they're raising is they are uncomfortable. They are disquieted. They are stressed out by what is happening in Gaza. So I think uh, when uh, Bernie refers to the fact that especially young people are deeply Just affected and, and, and saying this is not okay, this is not in sync with our values, uh, he's absolutely right. But Senator, I want to push you a little bit on, on that because the Biden campaign has been stressing that, you know, they're focused on other issues such as reproductive rights and, and the economy. They think that those issues will matter more to voters. But you're saying you're hearing a lot about the Israel-Hamas war. Do you think the Biden campaign is correct? Well, I don't think that they are wrong. The reproductive rights are very right, important to young Americans. That's certainly the, the case. So is the cost of, of college is, is very important. But this is important as well. So there are, are folks who are saying, yes, we know that, that Biden's in our camp on, on canceling college debt. We, we know he's there on reproductive rights. But they are still coming out and saying they are deeply disturbed uh, that we are providing the bombs to Israel that Israel has used to, uh, to basically flatten most of Gaza, producing Sen enormous deaths of women and children. And Senator, uh, briefly, I want to switch to another topic. You have an amendment for the FAA reauthorization bill that would block the expansion of facial recognition technology at airports. Have you heard from Senator Schumer about where he stands on that amendment? Well, there are concerns uh, from many, for many senators from their home state airports who want an expansion. Let's understand what, what my point here is. There has never been a single hearing in the Senate or House on establishing a nationwide system of facial recognition that we would have to go through in order to ride a plane. And where does this lead to? Uh, first, there's an opt-out now that you can use documents. Uh, but TSA is saying they want to get rid of that opt-out in the future. And then if you're going to provide this sort of facial recognition for security on planes, uh, how about on trains? How about on buses? We have seen the power of facial recognition to be used by authoritarian governments to control their population. China has done so in a massive way with a, a million Uyghurs that are using it to help control their, their activities. We've now seen China sell this software to 80 other countries to control dissonance. The point of saying let's do a pause in order to have a congressional examination of this very significant issue is core to the issues of privacy and freedom. Thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate you being Thank here. Thank you. Thank you, Gabe. Good to be with you.
And coming up, delays, appeals, and testimony fallout. We're following new legal developments in three of former President Trump's criminal cases in Florida, Georgia, and New York, as the former president prepares to return to court tomorrow. Plus, President Biden hits battleground Wisconsin, blasting former President Trump and his record of job creation in some of the most important 2024 swing states. We'll have the latest from the trail straight ahead. You're watching Meet the Press Now. Welcome back. It's already been a wild week in the multiple criminal cases facing former President Trump. And it's just Wednesday. In his hush money trial, we heard graphic testimony from adult film star Stormy Daniels yesterday about her alleged affair with Mr. Trump. Today, the Georgia Court of Appeals granted Mr. Trump's request to reconsider whether Fulton County DA Fonnie Willis should be disqualified from the election interference case. And Judge Eileen Cannon, a Trump appointee, has now postponed his classified documents trial indefinitely, citing issues around the documents at the heart of the case. I'm joined now by NBC News Justice and Intelligence Correspondent Ken Delaney, and he joins me on set. Now, we also have Blaine Alexander here with us for the latest in Fulton County. But Ken, I want to start with you. Why did Judge Cannon suspend this case indefinitely? The judge decided there were so many pending motions that she has not yet decided on that it wasn't even appropriate for her to set a date, which is pretty unusual in a federal trial. Usually a judge will set a date knowing that it can be changed later. And she scheduled five separate hearings, Gabe, to hear some of these motions. And some of them are, are issues that many legal experts say really aren't appropriate for a hearing, like how was the special counsel appointed, whether that was appropriate. The appeals court has already ruled on that. Is there any chance this trial begins before election day? There's a chance, but it's not looking likely, Gabe. Um, and look, it, it is common for trials to last, that these type of trials to last very long, right, because of all the classified information. Put it in context, how quickly is this moving? or is it not moving quickly at all in your view? So that's the thing. A lot of the issues around classified information have not even been decided yet. Those hearings are happening in secret. What we're seeing are the sort of run-of-the-mill motions that every defendant makes to try to dismiss cases. And often judges don't give the kind of time that she's giving. She's having a hearing on every single one and it's just burning court time. So do you think this changes how the special counsel approaches this case at all? I don't think it can. I mean, she hasn't given them grounds to say you should remove yourself, you're biased. I mean, and so I'll, they have to live with this and just kind of play out the string knowing that they probably won't get this case to trial on time. Ken Delaney, and thanks. I want to hold you right there. Blaine Alexander joining us again from Georgia. Blaine, was today's ruling down there a surprise? It really wasn't, Gabe. I mean, I think that this was expected that the Court of Appeals would at least hear this case uh, from Donald Trump, this appeal from Donald Trump, rather. You know, we've also, uh, through the course of this Georgia trial, we've already seen several other issues go before the Court of Appeals. Most notably, earlier this year, Mark Meadows trying to get the case removed to federal court. A lower court had decided, no, that's not going to happen. He appealed it up to the Court of Appeals. They heard it. They also agreed with the lower court. So I think that's also kind of important in, in, in acknowledging that just because, of course, this is going to be heard for an appeal doesn't necessarily indicate which way it's going to go, but we did expect that it would be likely that an appeal would be heard in this. So, Blaine, what happens next and when? Well, I think it's important to point out that this is going to bring a lot less drama, I think is the right word, than what we saw in the first kind of iteration of this. Initially, we saw it play out before TV cameras. The DA herself took the stand for the better part of two hours. There was kind of salacious testimony. That's not going to happen this time around. So what happens next is that they go before a panel of judges, the Court of Appeals, and each side gets about 15 minutes to present their case. The judges then go back, they consider it, and they issue their ruling. Now, we don't know when that's going to happen. It doesn't have to happen any time soon. They've got several months before they actually need to schedule this and can hear it. But at the same time, it's important to point out, Gabe, that Judge Scott McAfee, the Superior Court judge here in Fulton County, has made it clear he's not going to stop his proceedings. He's not going to stop his train from moving forward. He will still hear different motions. He'll still, still have different hearings as necessary while this appeals process plays out. Blaine, what if the appeals court disqualifies Bonnie Wells. What happens then to this case? 
if the appeals court disqualifies her, and, and that is a big if, then that means her entire office is disqualified. So if she goes, it's not like her office can continue. It disqualifies her and her office. It would then go before a prosecutor's counsel here in Georgia, and basically the case would be reassigned to some other DA or they would find somebody else to prosecute it. That, of course, would bring its own large set of complications because you're talking about a DA that would want to take on the case. You're talking about finances. You're talking about what this would look like. And if somebody else were to take it on, would they substantially change uh, the charges here and change the entire way of prosecuting this? So but, but, that certainly is something. I've actually spoken with the person who's, who would be in charge of that. They're kind of considering what that would possibly look like. Uh, but again, that would be a very big if, if she but, were disqualified here. Well, Blaine, you, you hit something there. Somebody else might take this case on. What prosecutor would take this politically charged case on besides Willis? Especially in the case in the state of Georgia, exactly. right? I think that's, that's a really point. important point yeah. to make. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're talking about a very red state, just kind of like two or three blue counties. And that is kind of admittedly, when I spoke with the person who's in charge of this, that's one of the big considerations. Who would take this on, especially seeing the microscope that Fonnie Willis was under, watching what she went through for the better part of two months with this kind of challenge uh, and these allegations against her, and seeing that there were other prosecutors who didn't even want to sign on to the case under her in the first place, Gabe. Blaine Alexander, Ken Delaney, and thank you both so much. And up next, the second gentleman meets the press. How Doug Emhoff is ramping up the reproductive rights fight as the Biden administration makes abortion access the centerpiece of its reelection strategy. NBC's exclusive interview is next. You're watching Meet the Press Now. Welcome back. Vice President Harris is in Battleground, Pennsylvania today talking about abortion rights as the Biden campaign looks to seize on one of the few issues our NBC News poll shows the president has an advantage over Donald Trump. And it's an issue where public opinion broadly matches President Biden's position. It comes a day after Harris's husband, Second Gentleman Doug Emhoff, traveled to Georgia to hold an event focused on mobilizing men to advocate for reproductive rights. He joined NBC's Yamish Alcindor after the event for an exclusive interview. It's a topic rarely discussed and one the second gentleman is focusing on, the role men can play in advocating for abortion rights. It is a medical health care crisis. On Tuesday in an exclusive interview with NBC, Doug Emhoff said he wants men to see reproductive health care as an issue impacting the fundamental freedoms of everyone. This is a issue of fairness to women. Women are dying. Um, it's affecting men's ability to plan uh, their lives. And it's also an issue of what's next, what, what other freedoms are at risk. Emhoff spoke to NBC in Atlanta, where he convened a panel on the role men can play in pushing for abortion access. The event was timed to mark the fifth anniversary of Georgia's six-week ban on most abortions. Being in this position of being second gentleman and also being the first man ever to be in this role, um, it, it just would be wrong for me not to use this microphone to advocate for this issue. What's your message to the many male lawmakers that we've seen be part of restricting abortion rights? Stop it. Listen to the people in this country. See what's going on. Listen to doctors, listen to nurses. Uh, listen to men and women who are suffering because of those actions. As part of his efforts, Emhoff said he's been talking to men across the country and in his personal life. I'm talking about this with my other dad friends. I'm talking about it with my son, about how this is gonna impact him and, and how he's gonna start a family or not. Tuesday's event was a collaboration between Emhoff and a group called Men for Choice, which has held other gatherings with the second gentleman. Cecil Price III is a Morehouse student and a member of Men for Choice. It hurts me um, to see that potentially the rights uh, of my sisters, of my mother, uh, can be taken away. Uh, and I have a responsibility and a duty as a brother, but also as a leader, to advocate for them. Meanwhile, several women, including Shawana Moore, said they welcomed men organizing around abortion. We need all hands on deck. Moore, a nurse, said her husband, speaking up for her soon after she had their son, saved her life. I had to have an emergency C-section. So I had too much bleeding, and my blood pressure was basically plummeting. But it was my husband who really advocated for my health and well-being. And 
that's critical. Meanwhile, like his wife, Vice President Kamala Harris, and President Biden, Emhoff pointedly criticized former President Trump and underscored what he believes is at stake in November. This is a binary election. You've got the former president on one side who is celebrating the overturn of Roe v. Wade, saying women must be punished. And then on the other side, you've got Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, who are on the right side of each and every one of these issues. And Yamish joins me now on set. Thank you so much for bringing us this interview. And look, the president, the vice president, the second gentleman, have all now been on the trail talking about abortion. How cognizant is the Biden campaign that this is, if not the top issue, one of the top issues for them? They're very aware of the fact that Donald Trump is weak on the issue of abortion in their minds and that voters overwhelmingly across this country, um, that they support abortion access. You saw in poll after poll that people say that they want to see access to abortion. Now, I should say the second gentleman, he was talking about the idea that they're on the right side of this. There is, of course, the Republicans on the other side of this who have been organizing and pushing for abortion restrictions. Former President Donald Trump says that this issue should be left to the states and that he's proud of the role that he took in overturning Roe v. Wade. And we should also note, of course, this is going to be on the ballot in November, and there are um, anti-abortion activists who are going to be making sure that they have their voices heard in this and trying to convince voters not to expand access to abortion access to, to abortion. But I think the second gentleman is just an example of sort of the work that the Biden campaign is trying to do here. And you also spoke with him about, well, several other topics, but you also focus on anti-Semitism. This was spoke with him just hours after President Biden delivered those remarks here in Washington. What do you tell you about that? It's personal for him, right? It's very personal for him. Doug Emhoff is the first Jewish spouse of a president or vice president, and he's been doing a lot of work on anti-Semitism. So I asked him about his work there. Take a listen to what he told me. It is okay to exercise your right of free speech, and it is okay for valid criticism of policies of, of Israel that you don't agree with. That, that's okay to, to do that. But when it crosses over into what we've seen, you know, someone holding up a sign that says, pointing at Jewish students, Hamas, that's your next victim. That is just outrageous. It's wrong. It's anti-Semitic, and it must stop. And he told me that the Biden administration is doing their best that they can to try to end the conflict between between Israel and Hamas. He said that he understands that there's criticism there of Israel, but that he doesn't want Jewish students to be targeted in this way. Yeah, and that's a thorny issue for the administration right now. Of course, look, the White House has said that President Biden won't go and meet with protesters. That, that the image of that could be very challenging. But did you talk to the second gentleman about that? Because you know, his wife, the vice president, has been on these college tours and, you know, young people on college campuses will, of course, be so crucial to the uh, to the Democrats. What do you have to say about walking that fine line um, in the months before the election? Well, he told me he's going to be going to college campuses to talk about anti-Semitism, to talk about abortion rights. Yeah. And he's also already been holding calls with Jewish students who feel targeted in these pro-Palestinian uh, protests. But I think it's interesting to hear the second gentleman saying he wants to go and put boots on the ground in college campuses. And he's always still saying that he wants to advocate against all kind of hate, Islamophobia, attacks on LGBTQ communities. So he's really, I think, at least saying that he really wants to be out there like he was yesterday in Atlanta. Yamish, thank you so much. And thank you for the exclusive interview. And turning now to college campuses, where universities are increasingly turning to police to crack down on pro-Palestinian protests. Last night in Massachusetts, 130 people were arrested at UMass Amherst as police cleared an encampment there. And blocks from the White House, D.C. police used pepper spray to clear an encampment at George Washington University, which has been the rally point for several D.C. area schools. Police say they initially resisted pressure to clear the demonstration, but the protests had become, quote, volatile. D.C. Mayor Miro Bowser has been under pressure from congressional lawmakers to act, including House Republicans, who canceled today's scheduled hearing with the mayor as they lauded the police action last night. And after the break, will President Biden's big bet on infrastructure pay off as voters give the president lackluster marks on some of the administration's top achievements in new polls? We'll dig into the numbers. The panel's next. You're watching Meet the Press Now. Stay with us. And welcome back. Turning now to the campaign trail. President Biden went to Battleground, Wisconsin today to announce a massive investment by Microsoft to build an artificial intelligence data center. 
There was perhaps a little trolling at play here as the site is the same location where Donald Trump touted a large investment by Taiwanese electronics manufacturer Foxconn. That just didn't happen. Here's some of what President Biden had to say today. Came here with your Senator Ron Johnson literally holding a golden shovel promising to build the eighth wonder of the world. Are you kidding me? <laughs> Look what happened. They dug a hole for those golden shovels, and then they fell into it. Foxconn turned out to be just that, a con. Go figure. It's one of many events the president is holding, leaning into his record on jobs and the economy. But a new political morning consult poll shows that many voters aren't connecting with the president's signature legislative accomplishments, including the Inflation Reduction Act and the bipartisan infrastructure law. And as Biden tours the country touting the investment from that infrastructure package he shepherded into law, the same poll has voters ranking him and Donald Trump as basically the same on the issue. Joining me now on set is Scott Wong, senior congressional reporter for us here at NBC News, former Maryland Democratic Congresswoman Donna Edwards. She's also an NBC News political analyst and Republican strategist uh, Garrett Ventry. Thank you all so much for joining us here on Meet the Press Now. Scott, I want to start with you. You know, President Biden holding that event uh, today in Wisconsin, message still not going through. I feel like we've been talking about this for months. And the campaign says eventually this message will start to take hold. It really has not yet. What do you make of that? Yeah, I mean, you know, I've often said the the president has been one of the most productive presidents we've seen uh, in quite some time. Uh, you know, COVID relief, gun reform, uh, Inflation Reduction Act, in infrastructure, and yet uh, it's just not connecting with voters, right? Yeah, and you know, Politico um, today had uh, had some reporting that a very small fraction. Uh, of the uh, the infrastructure law and some of that, uh, some of those projects, uh, the money hasn't been spent yet. Do you think that that is playing into this? Well, I I, uh, I also wonder, you know, have people seen the signs for many of these infrastructure bridges, roads, you know, as they're traveling around the country? Do they know that President Biden is responsible for this? I think this is a marketing problem for the president of the United States. Uh, Democrats I've talked to recently, even just today on Capitol Hill, Bobby Scott says uh, the president needs to brag more about it. He needs to go out and sell this and be more aggressive. I also think maybe President Biden needs to get some of his allies to get out there, Doug Emhoff and, and Kamala Harris and Pete Buttigieg, just to name a few. Donna, I want to turn to you. What do you make of this? Talking about a marketing problem, do you agree? Or is this, are we just in such a hyper-partisan time that marketing doesn't matter at this point? Well, I do think that there's a matter of rinse and repeat, that the president has to say this over and over again for it to take hold. He has to uh, go and stand in front of those projects. And like, one of the really difficult things is it's infrastructure. You don't just build things overnight. It takes some time for that to actually play out into communities. But where he can, I think the president just needs to do it over and over and over again uh, through Election Day. And Garrett, what do you make of those numbers as a Republican strategist? Do you look at those numbers and think, look, Donald Trump's doing very well, but another candidate might have done even better, um, you know, to make this election a, a referendum on Joe Biden instead of the theatrics of Donald Trump? Yeah, I mean, I would say it's still a referendum on Joe Biden if you look at the numbers and if you look at the polling here. So Joe Biden has a marketing issue. That's part of it here when you're talking about people don't know about those significant legislative reforms. They also don't think they help them. That's part of the problem, too, right? And the third part is they don't give him credit. You know, for infrastructure, like I said, they give Donald Trump a two-point lead right. on infrastructure, mm -hmm. right? So that's another marketing problem. But I think it's the bigger problem if you take a step back. You're talking about voters usually th three-fourths around that say the country's heading in the wrong direction. They overwhelmingly disapprove of Joe Biden's handling on the economy, on inflation, on the border, on national security. And if you look at the head-to-head -head matchup, Donald Trump's beating him in this poll, and he's also beating him with independents. Those are the persuadable voters, right? Mm -hmm. There is the partisan environment, but everyone knows this election comes down to about 5 to 10% of persuadable voters. And right now, they're breaking for Donald Trump. 
because they think they have a comparison here. They think mm -hmm. the economy was better under Trump, they, the border was better under Trump, they think the world was more safe under Donald Trump, and so that's the problem that Joe Biden has going head-to-head -head with him right now. Donna, I want to put up some numbers that our uh, pal Mark Murray uh, got for us. Democrats are outspending Republicans two to one at this point on the airwaves. So how much of an impact does this early cash advantage have? Well, I think it has a tremendous impact. I mean, you look at not just the spending uh, on media that President Biden is doing, but you also look at the fact that he's building out his campaign infrastructure all across the country. And I think one thing that you can see about the polling um, that we can see is that Donald Trump has re remained basically where he is. And over the last six months, it's President Biden who's been ticking up and ticking up and ticking up. And I think that's what the Biden campaign is counting on. And I want to turn now to Scott and a question on your beat. Speaker Johnson today got on the steps of the Capitol and he you know, held a big press conference talking about this law that he is pushing to ban non-citizens from voting. By the way, it's already illegal, but he insists that this, this bill is needed. I want to play something of what he had to say. We all know intuitively that a lot of illegals are voting in federal elections, but it's not been something that is easily provable. We don't have that number. This legislation will allow us to do exactly that. It will prevent that from happening. And if someone uh, tries to do it, it will now be unlawful and the states will have a mechanism to prove whether they are or not. So Scott, what's the rationale behind this? Is this a solution without a problem? Well, I, I think we have to take a step back and also point out that uh, Mike Johnson was one of the architects of, uh, you know, devising this argument uh, for overturning the 2020 election. So they were talking about election integrity repeatedly throughout this press conference, pointing to uh, undocumented immigrants voting, which, you know, we haven't seen widespread proof of that. We asked him to show us numbers. Right. He couldn't point to that. And, and so it was significant that he was standing with a lot of the figures who, uh, you know, who, who were behind the January 6th effort to overturn the election, standing on the steps of the very Capitol where, where the rioters had, had entered the House of Representatives. And sure, look, Republicans are trying to make immigration an issue no matter what. A couple of weeks ago, I was down at Mar-a-Lago at the press conference with Speaker Johnson and Donald Trump. This bill uh, came up. Will it be successful, though, in, in, in the coming months? I asked Speaker Johnson directly, I said, is this purely a messaging bill because it's going to go nowhere in the Democratic-controlled Senate? President Biden's not going to sign it into law. He pushed back. He says, well, we, we won't know what's going to happen until the House of Representatives passes this and gets it over to the other chamber. Don, I want to turn to you. Is this just a messaging bill? It's totally a messaging <laughs> bill, and it's a bad one, given that Republicans are the ones who actually killed uh, the border security mm -hmm. legislation. And it, it is a prob it, it's not a problem that exists. There is no voter fraud. Uh, the 2020 election was secure. Our elections and our infrastructure are secure. Uh, this is a problem that doesn't need to be fixed. So, Garrett, something that we have not really talked about too much today is Donald Trump because we have a day off in his trial. He has repeatedly said that he need, you know, did not want to be in court because it was keeping him from campaigning. Well, guess what? He's not campaigning uh, today. What do you make of that? Yeah, I think, listen, I mean, he's, he's in court a lot here. I think the president having a, a night off to talk to supporters I don't think is a bad thing. I think he has been doing these campaign stops when he can. He's been doing the rallies that he can as well. And I think their RNC is beefing up their operation in these early states, which is really important as well. But if you look at the you know campaign schedule of Donald Trump, the campaign schedule of Joe Biden, I think we've seen Donald Trump more available for interviews and hitting the campaign trail in a harder way. But this time around, he just isn't taking advantage of the precious time he has during the week. Yeah, I mean, again, I think you're, you're talking about being in court, you know, four days a week here. I think going back and having dinner with supporters is not the worst thing in the world. Okay. Donna, I want to put up part of our friend Chuck Todd's new column. He thinks that there is a way for Biden, President Biden, to reach some of the voters who dislike both the president and the former president by acknowledging his shortcoming. And it's right there on the screen. He writes that President Biden has to be honest about his inability to fulfill the promise of his inaugural address. What's his plan to bring the country together in a second term? And how does he introduce tolerance of differing political opinions to some in his own party who don't like what they hear from the populist right? What do you, you know what I have to say? I mean, it's interesting, but I, I think for the 
uh, in defense of the president, he went into a campaign promising to bring the country together, and January 6th happened, and that really changed the entire context of the way to think about the country and to try to move forward. It's President Biden who's been the one that reached out on major legislation mm -hmm. to bring on Republicans. It's President Biden who reached out on, on Ukraine to make sure that there could be a, a Ukraine funding bill. Uh, so I think he's been trying. It's just difficult, right. and you can't talk people out of how they're feeling. But with the messaging from the campaign, threats to democracy, that's a pretty stark message and doesn't sound like he's trying to unite the country there. What do you make of that? Well, I think if you look at the vast majority of the American people, they believe that our democracy is at, an, in a, at a crucial uh, point. And President Biden delivered that message in 2022. It, I thought it was very effective. And I think they're leaning into the freedom message in 2024. And, you know, we'll see how voters take it. And Scott, I'm turning now to uh, another uh, primary yesterday in Indiana. Nikki Haley took more than 20 percent of the vote there, despite obviously not being in this race for quite a while. What, do you, what are the broader implications of that? Well, I was talking to Republicans on Capitol Hill today just about that 22 percent, a staggering number, you know, tens of thousands of votes. Uh, I think it's setting off alarm bells in the Donald Trump campaign, because if you look at where a lot of those votes are coming from, they're coming from the suburbs. And as we know, uh, elections are won and lost in the suburbs. And so that has got to be a warning sign for, for Donald Trump. And might that factor into his vice presidential pick, perhaps? <laughs> Perhaps. I'm sure they're taking a hard look at that. All right, Scott, Donna, Garrett, thank you all for joining me here on the panel. I appreciate it. Still to come, two more states with some of the strictest abortion restrictions in the country move closer to voting on the key issue this November. That story's next. You're watching Meet the Press Now. Welcome back. With abortion set to be a key issue in the 2024 election, some states are taking that issue straight to the voters. South Dakota and Missouri are the latest states where abortion rights organizers say they've cleared the signature threshold to put constitutional amendments enshrining abortion access on the ballot. So far, three states will officially see abortion at the polls, but at least eight others, including Missouri and South Dakota, look likely to join them. Joining me now is NBC Politics reporter Adam Edelman. Adam, thank you so much for joining us. As, as we mentioned, Missouri and South Dakota join Arizona as states with the signatures, but they're not officially on the ballot yet. So what's next for these amendments? The rest of it's pretty logistical. Uh, over the next weeks and months, officials in both Missouri and South Dakota will review these signatures. There's tens of thousands of them in each state, and then they'll basically decide whether they're certified for the ballot. Uh, in Missouri, you could see a lot of legal challenges. In South Dakota, well, really in both, you could see a lot of legal challenges. Uh, there's a fixed deadline in South Dakota that's in August. And what efforts are we seeing from abortion rights opponents to block these measures or add some of their own? We're really seeing quite a number of them. In Missouri, for example, Republicans in the legislature have essentially advanced their own uh, proposal that would raise the threshold for future constitutional amendments to pass. If they got that on the ballot in August, when there's a primary race, and it passed, it would then make it difficult, more difficult, for voters to pass the abortion rights amendment in November. In Arizona, meanwhile, Republicans in the legislature there have put forward uh, or are considering putting forward a number of proposals uh, that would compete with the abortion uh, access amendment, including one that would uh, preserve explicitly the ability of lawmakers to regulate uh, issues that pertain to reproductive rights. And Adam, I was talking about this with Yamiche a little earlier. Uh, the issue of abortion rights on the ballot in November, what effect could those efforts to expand access uh, play in the presidential contest or the, the most competitive congressional races? Well, the Biden campaign, as well as Democrats up and down the ballot, have leaned into abortion rights and reproductive rights uh, as issues that they feel can help them in their campaigns. And over the past uh, two years, really, you know, since Roe v. Wade was struck down in 2022, that's been a successful strategy for Democrats up and down the ballot. Now, in ruby red states like South Dakota and Missouri, which we're discussing, uh, it might not be enough. Republicans tend to win by such large margins in those states that uh, putting abortion rights explicitly on the ballot could still win and 
and then at the same time not help Democrats win. In Arizona, however, you could see it really be a difference maker. Uh, Arizona is a battleground state with a large number of independent voters, a large number of undecided voters, and a growing number of suburban voters, all to whom uh, reproductive rights and specifically abortion rights could really uh, be the difference when they cast their vote in November. Adam, really quickly, uh, we just have a few seconds left, but how much are candidates counting on a 22 midterm-like turnout on this issue? I think they're counting on it pretty heavily. As you can see in the messaging from the Biden campaign, as well as several Senate uh, Democratic candidates, uh, a lot of these campaigns have made a bet that this is going to be an issue that really helps them in the fall. Adam Edelman, thank you so much. We're back Thanks. tomorrow with more Meet the Press Now. I'm Gabe Gutierrez. The news continues with Ryan Nobles in for Hallie Jackson right now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.